morning, everyone. I'm Maggie Rowe, the marketing events manager here at Flyleaf. Thank you so much for coming out on this rainy day to hear Kelly Barnhill present her new book, The Ogres and the Orphans, which we've, we've just learned has popped up, is in the top 10 for the New York Times bestseller list. It made the list today. So we're very, very excited. That's a very, very big deal in children's publishing. So congratulations, Thank Kelly. You. We're very excited to celebrate with you tonight. So thanks for coming here and from buying your book from Flyleaf because that helps us bring programs here to the bookstore. So without your support, we cannot do programming like this and bring books like this to you in the community. So thanks again. Um, we close at seven tonight. So after Kelly does her presentation and reading, um, she's gonna answer some questions that you might have. And then um, if there's any more um, discussion that goes on and wants to happen after seven, we might ask you to kind of move it on out the door so that my um, colleagues can close up the store around seven o'clock. Um, and we're also recording this event for YouTube, for our YouTube channel. So if you want to share it with friends, watch it again. Um, it is on our YouTube channel. So I'd then I'd like to introduce Kelly. Kelly Barnhill is a mother of three children and lives in Minnesota with her husband. She's the author of five novels for kids, and her last novel, The Girl Who Drank the Moon, won the 2017 John Newbery Medal, which is like the Oscar for kids writing, in case you guys don't know what that means. It's very important. She is also the winner of the World Fantasy Award and has been a finalist for the Minnesota Book Award, a Nebula Award, and the Penn USA Literary Prize. She is on week two of her tour and is visiting four schools with us here in the Chapel Hill area while she's here. We are so thrilled that she's come here to Flyleaf. So thank you, Kelly, and now I'd like to hand it over to you. Is this on? It is on. Yeah, this is on. Yeah, okay, good. Okay. Just give me one second. Let me get situated. There we go. Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm totally obsessed with the baby in the back, so I'm really glad that there's a baby here because everything's better with a baby. Um, uh, it's literally the reason why I keep going to church because there's babies there. Um, I don't know why anybody else would go. Um, uh, and uh, so thank you, thank you, baby, for coming um, and gracing us with your presence. Um, so hi, guys. My name is Kelly Barnhill, and I wrote this book, um, uh, uh, The Ogres and the Orphans. It still is like, I, I still have to sort of stop myself when I'm about to say it, because my go-to thing is to say I wrote The Girl Who Drank the Moon, because I've been yeah. saying that for a very long time. Um, but I wrote The Ogres and the Orphans, uh, which is a book I wrote by accident. And, um, and I didn't think I would be here again, honestly. I really didn't. I wrote The Girl Who Drank the Moon, and, um, and my life took a very strange turn. Uh, I, I didn't know that that book would perform in the way that it did. I didn't know it would do that what it did. I turned that book into my editor with a letter of apology. I said, I'm very sorry about this book. I don't think anybody's gonna like it. I don't think anybody's gonna get it. I think reviewers are gonna hate it. I don't think it's gonna sell well. And I promise I will do better next time, <laughs> is what I said. Now, at least my editor is a wonderful person, and I, um, I always do exactly what she says, except when it's, please turn in your man manuscript. And then I say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't speak English anymore. Um, and, uh, um, and she, but she was sort of a, a, attenuated to my um, uh, shenanigans at that point. We had already done one book together. <laughs> um, and, um, but the thing is that, you know, sometimes our work and our life are different things. And, um, uh, the, you know, the book did what it was going to do. And in the run up to when my book came out, you know, I, we had a very major illness in my family, my life became very different. Um, uh, I was going in and out of doctor's offices and waiting rooms and hospitals. And, and I told my publishers, listen, I can, I can show up a little bit, but, um, but please don't show me any reviews. Um, I'm not going to participate in any um, online stuff at all. I, I can't really know about the book. And so the book became, it was sort of like when an, a relative does so has something good happen that you haven't seen for that you love and you are happy for, but it doesn't really seem connected to you. And so, um, so the new brain was kind of a shock. Uh, um, it was a huge shock. Uh, and so, 
but but then you know because we're human beings and um uh, and prey to all the things that flesh is heir, is heir to, uh, all of those things that we that one might expect about um uh, uh, stress and um an imposter syndrome and uh, that feeling of undeservedness all of those things that maybe you have all felt in different times in your life was sort of like really big for me, and I thought you know what. Maybe this is my last book. Maybe this is my last book. And maybe that's okay that this is my last book. Maybe there's really not a place for my voice anymore. Um, uh, because what else do I really need, right? You know, the, my book went on Newberry. It's in 38 languages. It was on the, on the bestseller list. Like all of the things that were beyond my wildest dreams had happened. And maybe that was all fine. Um, I didn't tell Elise this. <laughs> I just kept on saying, I'll write a book later. Uh, and so that was what I thought. Um, but then the world got a real, got kind of funny um, uh, in the years after um, The Girl During the Moon came out. Uh, the world felt very mean to me. Uh, I used to call my phone the rectangle of doom. And it seemed to me that the news got worse and worse and worse. And not only that, that sense of neighborliness of connectedness, of what is the public good? What do we owe to our community? What do we owe to our neighbor? What does it mean to be a neighbor? All of this seemed to be going away. It seemed to me that there were a lot of people who were enlarging their stature and enlarging their, and even making money off of um, dividing people and demonizing people, and uh, being unkind to people, and um, and uh, and even um, uh, and even putting forth this idea that these people aren't our real neighbors, right? They're not real Americans. They're not real neighbors. They're not real community members. Like, um, uh, and so putting putting people in groups and boxes. And this was all very upsetting to me. So whenever I feel upset. I do this thing, I've been doing this for years. I start to write fairy tales. Um, just for me, I don't, sh I don't share them with anybody. This is just a creative practice. And if I'm being honest, a prayerful practice too. Um, I will, first thing in the morning, I'll go to my desk and I'll just do it on scratch paper or the, you know, every year the schools ask for the kids to bring packets of loose leaf papers and they never actually use them. And so I've got milk crates filled with like loose leaf paper. So I use those and I will just write out a fairy tale, brand new fairy tale every morning. I just will tell myself a story every morning. And, um, and, and because it allows me to inhabit that fairy tale brain, uh, which is a very important part of my brain and how I think about the world, and how I inhabit the world, and how I move forward in the world too. And I just throw them away. I'm, I mean, I recycle them, I'm, I'm not a monster. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and I would do that every single day, and it would be siblings on a journey, or it would be um, uh, the witch in the forest, or the monster in the hollow. It would be um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, people who, um, uh, uh, who aren't what they say they are, or worse, people who no longer know who they are anymore. Uh, and they need the people who love them to bring them back. Uh, and I just wrote them every single day, one after another after another. Then one day, I wrote a story that began and ended with a flock of crows. And right away, this story felt different to me. A story about an ogress that lived at the edge of a town that was lovely once upon a time, but wasn't anymore. Uh, an ogress who um, uh, was trying to do some good and decided to bake for her neighbors and left gifts in secret uh, on, their, on her neighbor's doorsteps. Uh, and, and right away, this story felt different to me. I wrote it for longer, first of all, but even, um, even the sound that my pen made on the paper, even reading it out loud, it felt different to me. And, um, and so I thought, huh. 
And so I, I got a, a moleskin notebook because I keep on buying them because it's just a, it's a, it's a habit. It's terrible. It's like my husband chastises me all the time. Why do you have so many? I just can't stop. Uh, and so I pulled out a new note, uh, moleskin notebook and I expanded it and sort of rounded the edges out and, and sort of teased some things out a little bit. And even still it felt different to me. I was like, huh. And then I, I typed it out and I shared it on my Slack group and you know, expanded it yet again. I was like, ladies, what is this? And I said, eh, you should probably, you should probably show this to Elise. So I did. And she said, okay. I said, maybe I wrote a picture book which is hilarious to me, my 400-page novel. <laughs> because I can't even spit in 500 words. Uh, and, uh, and she said, okay, I, I, see what you, I see what you did here. She said, this is actually a novel. You can't see it, and that's okay. But just spend time with those kids. There are 15 orphans who live in the orphan house um, uh, in this story. She said, spend time with those kids, and they're going to show you where the story is. Excuse me. Suddenly, now that we are traveling again, suddenly, like, we get colds now? Did you guys know? Like, they exist. <laughs> I have not had a cold in two years. Uh, and, and allergies, like, um, it was eight degrees when I left Minnesota. So um, uh, suddenly I come here and I was just like, what, pollen? <laughs> <laughs> so I took an allergy bed, but it's not quite getting at it. Anyway, so I, that's what I did. Uh, and I, I wrote notes and I played, played around and I had a box where I let my thoughts live for a while. And when I finally had what I needed to start, it was January of 2020. Um, and we were hearing about this virus that was in a, um, a, a faraway land that we knew was very serious. But, and we worried that it would come here, but we didn't really think that it would. And then I was sharing chapters in March, uh, the week before they closed down the schools. And one of the members of my writing group uh, got a little bit teary-eyed and she said, you know, all I wanna do is bake for my neighbors. And as I finished it, it was um, uh, uh, the spring of 2020. And um, I live in Minneapolis and George Floyd had just been murdered and my city, erupted in this expression of grief and pain and rage and sadness. And like everybody else, I the next day I got in my minivan with my garbage bags and my gloves and went over to the streets that were um, uh, that were impacted and started to help pick up debris. And like everybody else, there were tents that were set up all over the place uh, where people could leave groceries uh, because um, uh, uh, the people who lived in the area were suddenly without a uh, grocery store. That, and a lot of people relied on public transportation and that wasn't running, so people were donating groceries. And, and that question of what it means to be a neighbor became really important to me as I was going through the revision process. I'm going to read you this one chapter, um, uh, which isn't going to tell you anything about the crows, and it isn't going to tell you anything about the um, uh, the ogress either. Um, but it is going to tell you a little bit about where my head was when I began this story, um, and then maybe you can find out everything else on your own. So this is chapter three. It's called the town. This is also a story about a place called Stone in the Glen which used to be a lovely town. Everyone said so. Stone in the Glen had been famous for its trees. Shade trees in the parks, blossoming trees in the walkways, fruit trees lining the neighborhood streets with limbs that bent under the weight of abundant harvest each season. Anyone, any neighbor or friend or visitor from far, far away could reach up when the time was right and simply help themselves. People filled their baskets with apricots and persimmons, cherries and plums, apples and pears, depending on the time of year. They 
perfected recipes for tarts and pies and jams. They cooked fruit into candies, which they kept next to their front doors to give out to neighborhood children as they passed by. The streets of Stone in the Glen were a thing to behold in those days. People walked slowly under blossoming or green or fruiting trees, uh, taking their time as they enjoyed the dappled shade. Each night, street sweepers and scrubbers washed the, the cobblestones clean. The lamps made from blown glass and polished lovingly by hand glittered at night like stars. The street signs hadn't gone missing back then, nor had the public art back when it was a lovely town. In those days, townspeople lounged in promenades and public squares, discussing literature or politics or philosophy or art. All roads then led to the library, which had wide windows and tall shelves and deep cushions on the sofas and which welcomed everyone. There were handbound books and modern books and ancient scrolls and even texts carved into stones. The librarians bustled this way and that, sorting, preserving, shelving and shushing, and even their shushes were lovely. Neighbors worked together to make soup for the sick and cookies for classrooms. They swarmed like worker bees when a tree fell on a fence or when a roof needed vending or when somebody's mother had broken a leg. Neighbors cared for one another once upon a time, back when it was a lovely town. But then, one terrible night, the library burned. Different people remember terrible events differently. There were many stories explaining what happened that night in Stone in the Glen, and nearly all of them disagreed. Some insisted that it was a miscreant who set the fire, claiming that they had heard footsteps echoing with sinister purpose, moving towards the vulnerable building and then scampering away once the flames erupted. Others swore they heard the wings of a dragon flying overhead. Dragons were more common in those days than they are now, after all, and who loves fire more than a dragon? Others shook their head and said that the fire had been inevitable. The place was a tinderbox, old wood and old paper and the occasional candle that someone left unattended, a disaster waiting to happen, people said gravely. If anyone asked me, and no one did, I could have told them that they all were correct. There was indeed a candle left burning, and then I heard malevolent footsteps approaching in the dark. Within moments, a dragon unfurled itself into the fullness of its size and power at the back of the library, the bright gleam of its scales shattering the night. I watch it as it slithered up the side and coiled its long neck around the western turret. It grinned as it unhooked its jaws. I would have told anyone if they asked me, but no one asked. While there was little consensus among the townsfolk about the fire's cause, everyone was in perfect agreement regarding what happened next. How the bells rang in the middle of the night and everyone from the oldest to the youngest raced from their beds, pulling coats over their nightclothes and sliding bare feet into galoshes. They ran through darkened streets, carrying buckets, following the billowing smoke and that awful firelight. The fire, they say, rose in great towers over the library, so bright it hurt their eyes just to look at it. Heat poured from the building in great waves, crackling people's eyelashes and shriveling the leaves in the nearby trees. Books flew from melting windows like panicked birds, their wings bright and phosphorescent. They were beautiful for a moment. The town remembers the way a heart is beautiful in the moment before it breaks. The people of Stone in the Glen arranged themselves into a line 
desperately passing buckets, throwing water onto the flames. It, it was a useless exercise. The fire was too big. The wood beams were too dry. And paper has no choice but to burn. Side note. There's a note on one of my manuscripts early on. This, this whole bit, you know, I hardly changed at all um, over my many, many revisions. But there was one note from my beloved editor, who I normally follow all of her advice. But on that line, and paper has no choice but to burn, she wrote, I'm not sure that tracks. And under that is a note from me that says, this is the hill I will die on. <laughs> I still stand by it. <laughs> For years after, the burned library remained in place, a tangle of ash and old metal and fallen charred stone situated between the orphan house and the center square. No one had the heart to clear the, to clear the debris away. No one could bear to touch a single stone. When people walked by, they held their breath. The children in the orphan house grew up next to the remains of the library. They could smell the smoke and ash. At night, the ghosts of old books haunted their dreams. After the library burned, the town school too burned down. A tragic coincidence, everyone said. They held on to one another and breathed. Soon after, several other buildings burned as well. Homes, shops, beloved spaces, and a rash of fires that spanned a little more than a year. After the fires, the fruit trees, and then the blossoming trees, and then the shade trees began to die off as well. A blight, people said, perhaps caused by the smoke, or maybe that terrible heat or maybe it's just terrible luck. The people up town, in the town watched in sorrow as tree after tree came down. And with the trees died the shade. The light in Stone in the Glen became a constant searing whiteness and difficult to bear. People squinted to look at one another, their faces creased into permanently angry expressions. Without the trees, there was no root system to soak up the water when it rained and sown in the glen, stone in the glen began to experience, experience damaging floods, <coughs> Excuse me. one after another, which finally caused an enormous sinkhole to open right next to the beautiful park where the children used to play, nearly swallowing it whole. It was too dangerous to play there anymore. In fact, it began to feel too dangerous to play anywhere in Stone in the Glen. There was no shade. There were no trees to climb. The whole town seemed to scowl. Neighbors glared at one another with, with creased brows and narrowed eyes. People retreated into their homes. They stopped letting their children wander freely. They locked their doors and latched their shutters. Shut away and apart, they stopped thinking about their neighbors and stopped helping their neighbors. There was no more soup for the sick, no more sweets for children, no more cookies for classrooms. Well, that goes without saying, as there were no more classrooms. Best people thought that we keep to ourselves. And so they did. They peeked through their shutters at the empty streets with a great sadness in their hearts. It used to be such a lovely town, people said, but it isn't anymore. on that light note. Um, <laughs> I don't know my readings. I always really bum people out at the beginning. I swear there's funny parts. There's a lot of funny parts. <laughs> um, but I am really curious if you guys have any questions. Does anybody want to know anything from me um, or um, have curiosities about this book or about really about anything? You know? Yes. Uh, 
Um, are there any like people in your life that inspired the orphans or the orphans? Really good question. So um, I loved writing about the orphans because um, so there's 15 orphans. Um, uh, they're, um, uh, 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 and they have, I, I just, I love them so much here. I have to actually look at their names because otherwise I'll forget one and then they'll be upset. <laughs> um, uh, uh, their names are Anthea, Bartleby, Cassandra, who prefers Cass, Deirdre, Elijah, Fortunate, Gratitude, Hiram, Iggy, Justina, Kai, Lily, Maud, and the babies, Nanette and Orpheus. <gasps> I love them so much. And one of the things that I really liked about writing that is that um, I come from a really big family. Um, and uh, so I'm the oldest of five kids, but I'm also one of uh, 28 cousins. And we often would have lots and lots of cousins at my house at um, any given time. My mom did a lot of childcare uh, uh, for my various cousins. And that sort of sense of belonging and togetherness in a big not of lots and lots of kids is a very singular experience and very awesome. Um, one of the cool things I think about being a sibling and being in a big family is this idea of like of almost like gravitational force. You know, one of the things that we learn in physics is that we can't know what the shape of a particle is without knowing the shape of the particles that are near it, right? Because the shape of the particles that are near it change the shape of the particle itself. The shape of this chair, the gravity of this chair changes the shape of me. The shape of the world is altered minutely by the shape of us, right? The shape of the earth is also altered by the shape of the sun and vice versa. We're all in relationship with one another. We're all impacted by one another. We're all fundamentally changed by the people we are in relationship with, right? And so that sense when you are a sibling, uh, who I am with my siblings you know, um, is altered when we're all together as opposed to how I am apart. And so that was really fun to play with that. Right, um, and to play with that idea, Anthea, um, amidst all of her siblings, her orphan siblings, is different than Anthea alone. Same with Bartleby. Same with Cass, uh, and they all need one another, just like I need my siblings. I still do, even though I'm a grown up. Uh, so it wasn't that any one of them was inspired by any of the people. Although I would say that Cass is probably likely largely. Um, uh, 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 if not based on, but at least impacted by um, uh, by my daughter Cordelia, who goes by Cor, um, and um, I, I think that that's the only person that I can really like see a direction. Although, although I didn't mean to do that, it just sort of happened that way. I was like, oh, Cor is in this character. I see that, um, and so so that so that is certainly true. Um, and uh, and certainly the character of Myron, um, who's um, uh, the matron of the orphan house, has a husband named Myron, who's an extremely old man, uh, who's largely um, uh, uh, influenced by my beloved grandfather, who, who died many years ago. So for sure, people in my life sort of, I often don't mean to do that. I just see them. I say, oh, I see you in there, you know. So anyway, great question. Yes. What were your favorite books when you were a kid? Oh, so many books. So I was a huge weirdo. Um, and let's uh, just start with that. Uh, so first of all, I was a delayed reader um, and didn't really start coming to reading until later. I, I, because, you know, I come from a family that really prioritized books. I knew that one should read. I was very good at pretending to read. Um, uh, I knew that one should read. Uh, but it took me a while to sort of like be cognitively ready to like become a reader. Uh, but I loved books out loud. I loved, loved, loved books out loud. My dad would read to us every night. Um, uh, and so he read um, uh, all of Grimm's fairy tales. He read all of C.S. Lewis. He read a lot of Dickens, um, uh, a lot of um, Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, and um, and then once I got to be older, once I, when um, one of my jobs, starting when I was eight, uh, one of my tasks um, um, every Saturday was to 
take the little red wagon and bring my younger siblings and any cousins that were there to the library. Um, in fact, Walker Library is an awesome place and there's another um, children's author in Minneapolis named Ann Ursu uh, who also grew up in Walker Library. We didn't know each other as children, but we do like to say that we were raised by the same librarians. Uh, and um, it was the, um, uh, the librarians at Walker Library were extremely indulgent with me. They taught me this magical thing called interlibrary loan, which was amazing. So I was really a fairy tale kid. I loved reading fairy tales. I read um, collections of fairy tales all from all over the world. But then I learned about the Oz books. And that was very fun because a lot of those books were out of print at the time. Now, many of them are coming back into print now, um, uh, thanks to the uh, New York Review of Books. But, um, but at the time, they were really hard to find another reason why I used interlibrary loan. Um, and I, they were so weird. Oh my gosh, they were so weird. And I just ate them up with a spoon. Uh, and then when I was a little bit older, I discovered Diana Wynne Jones, and that was really it for me. Um, then I was a fantasy kid. So, great question. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Yes. Do you think um, being a mother has influenced your writing? For sure. You know, um, I uh, took a lot of creative writing classes in college and was a and just um, wrote constantly when I was when I was in college. To, um, uh, poetry all day long. Um, uh, I wrote a novel that nobody will ever see, and um, and and I just like I couldn't wait to get back to the page. I, it, it felt like a well that would never run dry. It was this incredible experience. But then I graduated and I entered into what I like to call the post-college ennui. Uh, and, um, and, and it just stopped. My urge to write simply stopped. Uh, and, um, and I was like, well, I, I guess I'm not a writer, right? Like, I must not be. And so I did other things, you know, I um, uh, uh, waited on tables, I became a janitor, I was, um, uh, I, um, uh, I delivered phone books for a while, I was a park ranger for a while, I was trained as a wildland firefighter, I became a teacher, I came back to Minneapolis, I had my kids. And so by the time I was 30, I had three kids and a minivan. Um, and, um, and, you know, I had been uh, laid off from the Minneapolis public schools, I was trying to figure out other things to do. Um, and, and, and so it was really while I sort of like had these like little kids around that I started returning to writing. And, and I think that it is, it is very likely true that the books that I was reading out loud to my kids, because I was reading a lot of middle grade books out loud, uh, I had already been reading them out loud as a, as a, um, as a teacher, um, uh, because even though my kids were older, I was teaching seventh grade, like they were all sort of all over the spectrum in terms of their of their reading ability. Um, uh, I was title one school, they were sort of all over the place. And so reading um, uh, uh, middle grade books out loud was super, it was the best part of the day. And, but also when my husband and I first started having children, you know, we were so broke, we didn't have two nickels to rub together. Uh, and so, you know, we were in baby jail. So, um, uh, and so we would read middle grade books out loud to each other. They're, they, they're the best for like the, that, they, they are the most facilitative for reading out loud, I feel. Uh, and for me, as, a, as somebody who came to story, as, a, as somebody who interacted with stories out loud, um, uh, who loved listening to stories, who loved telling stories, um, I would tell stories to my younger siblings all the time. I used to tell stories to my kids all the time. Um, they would say, please read me a story from your imagination. Um, uh, and uh, we did that for years. Two of my books started out as stories that I, I read out that I just sort of made up for my kids um, over the course of many, many evenings. And, um, and so, uh, uh, so for sure, it, they have shaped me in terms of like how I think of myself as a writer, but also how I think of story. So, um, but so as a result, my son Leo, um, uh, I, I, uh, we, we kept on, I mean, we kept on reading out loud to each other until like basically last year, he's a junior, uh, and we just still want, and we, and we still do sometimes even now, it's like this like thing that we have, but so as a result, he always has like his favorites to win the Newberry, you know, he's still very upset that, um, the real boy didn't win. <laughs> 
<laughs> we would watch the the um, the telecast before school. I mean, so anyway, so that's the kind of huge nerds that I have raised. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Ladies and gentlemen, this was lovely. This was super lovely. I um uh I, I can't believe that I'm here again. I can't believe that I have this book again. Um uh and I I I have to say that I it is my hope that um uh, uh this question of neighborliness and what we owe to each other and um I, I hope that these con these conversations can continue. I like to tell people that um, uh, this is my my most Catholic book um, uh, uh, because this it, that that question is at the center of Catholic social teaching. Although some people like to forget that, <laughs> uh, and uh, and so I it is my hope that that um, uh, that that kids who read this might be able to ask those questions too, right? Because um, uh, in the end, um, uh, I, I do think that the reason why we read books and the reason why we do this work at all is this idea of, of radical empathy, right? Um, uh, we, fit, we see as another sees, we think as another, as another thinks, we um, uh, uh, experience what another experiences, we know what another knows. Um, and but even more than that, it is this um, uh, it is this way that we recognize that we are more than ourselves. We are more than ourselves. Uh, we are creatures with souls, which means that we're all connected to one another and we're all the same. And the more that we can, this is, this is why I'm so glad that bookstores exist and that libraries exist and that books exist and that we can share these books with other people and leave them on doorsteps and um, little free libraries and bus corners and whatever. Um, uh, uh, because we can offer that experience to someone else. And so I do think that this work matters. And so I'm glad you guys are all here. I hope you buy, not, not my book, you can buy any book and give it to somebody else. <laughs> Um, and, um, and I hope that we can, you know, grow that a little bit. So thanks so much, you guys. It was really wonderful to see you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, we have copies of her three books for sale, three most recent books for sale at the front. Um, and uh, she has signed them all, but she, if you want them personalized, we still have some time. Um, so anyway. Thank you so much. Yeah. That was great. And if you have any more questions, you can ask. Any more? Personally. Yeah, you can ask. You yeah, you can yeah. send them to me, and I can pass them along. Right. You can ask her personally. We have a little bit more time this evening around. So great. thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Should I sit over there? Oh yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I was struggling. I really I didn't smell that. I can't wait to tell me.